Over the years, across all forms of entertainment, we've been introduced to some fantastic antagonists. Some are irredeemable due to their reprehensible actions, but others have ended up becoming iconic because they showed redeemable qualities that made you end up feeling a degree of sympathy for their plight. Final Fantasy is no different in this regard. We've been blessed with some fantastic villains. They have become known for their diabolical schemes, cataclysmic power, and an incredible fashion sense. And their motivations have varied, from forces of nature like Cloud of Darkness, who were hell-bent on the complete and total annihilation of everything, through to oppressive despots like Emperor Matius and Vane Solidor. But part of the reason the Final Fantasy villains have stood the test of time for so many is the level of nuance given to characters that you're supposed to hate. So much so that sometimes we even find ourselves understanding why they were compelled to act in the way they did. These characters can also feature a high degree of complexity, with the likes of Kefka displaying more depth than many of the protagonists. And it means there's a level of escapism present that allows players from a safe distance to explore the darkness of humanity and what people will do when they're driven to the brink. Some, however, do a greater job of evoking a sense of empathy than others. So throughout this video, we thought it would be interesting to delve through seven bad guys who we've ended up feeling sorry for. And we're going to kick things off with one of the most notorious. Sephiroth has become a poster child for video game villainy. And amongst the roster of Final Fantasy antagonists, he is by far the most recognisable. What made Sephiroth quite special was his ability to evoke pure dread, despite having minimal screen time throughout much of Final Fantasy VII. Much of this was due to tales of his exploits, which were delivered via other characters or visual set pieces. They depicted the terrible crimes Sephiroth had committed after being driven by delusions of grandeur. And as the story progressed, we got to learn about the even larger atrocities that were planned. At the time, it was hard to see how Sephiroth could even remotely be seen as a sympathetic villain. But now, as the mystery has been expanded upon via supporting collateral related to the compilation of Final Fantasy VII, it's clear that there was always much more to Sephiroth than met the eye. Central to this was Sephiroth's upbringing. As a product of Shimra's unethical practices, Sephiroth lived as an unwitting prisoner for much of his life, and his father, Professor Hojo, lied about his parentage and toyed with Sephiroth's ever-developing emotions. Everything, at least from Hojo's perspective, was done in the name of science. But when Sephiroth's power started to become evident, wider departments within Shinra sought to take advantage. With no friends or close relatives, Sephiroth developed an inability to communicate and connect with others. And this was front and centre during his first mission, where he was placed in command of veteran soldiers. From the outset, he treated his comrades as underlings, as he had been brought up to believe that he was superior, and he stated the needlessness for emotion on the battlefield as he slaughtered Redoran soldiers in an effort to prove his worth. When he encountered empathy, however, Sephiroth became confused and started to question his upbringing. From this point, Sephiroth did start to understand his emotions a bit better, and was even able to develop friendships with two fellow soldiers in Angeal and Genesis. But those relationships devolved through lies and deception, and Sephiroth started to venture down a dark path. It showed that Sephiroth wasn't inherently a bad guy. He was merely a product of his environment, and his descent into madness was born of an existential crisis. Sephiroth came to realise that he had been manipulated by Shinra for years, and that much of his life was a lie. It was for this reason that he chose to believe certain truths about his lineage, and it led to him undertaking extreme actions as a way of retaliating for the relentless psychological persecution he had been forced to endure. It's unclear how this particular notion will play out within the Final Fantasy VII Remake continuity, but within the original canon at least, the compilation of Final Fantasy VII has been designed to allow players to see things from Sephiroth's point of view so that they can at least try to understand the reasons why, beyond the superficial. Having suffered through a torrid childhood, Seymour Guado had hoped to become the saviour of Spira by releasing it from an unending cycle of death. But even though his motivations were altruistic, and not too dissimilar from Yuna's, the path he chose saw him become a misguided madman. From a young age, Seymour became accustomed to hatred and persecution based on nothing more than who he was. 
born to Jiskal Guado and a human woman, Seymour was never accepted by the Guado people. And in order to keep the peace, his father, who served as the leader of the Guado, was forced to exile his family to Barge Island. Behind the scenes, Seymour's parents had planned for their son to become a saviour. They believed that if he was able to defeat sin, then it would force the citizens of Spira to forget their prejudice. But having become ill, Seymour's mother had no choice but to make Seymour undergo his pilgrimage when he was still a young child. And when the time came, even though his mother sacrificed her life to become the final Aeon, Seymour refused to go through with the final summoning and returned to Baj. Growing up alone took its toll on Seymour, and he started to develop nihilistic tendencies. He began to see death as a goal, a release for all the suffering people were forced to endure. And he decided that by becoming Sin, he would grant the greatest gift to all by laying waste to Spira and setting the world free from the pain of living. After a while, Seymour was welcomed back to Guado Salon by his father, but the wounds had not healed, and Seymour ended up murdering his father, so to inherit his title as a Maester of Yevon and get closer to realising his overarching plan. This would just be the beginning, as Seymour also championed the fateful Operation Meehen, despite knowing that countless crusaders in Albed would perish, and he also exterminated many of the Ronzo on Mount Gagazette. In the context of Seymour's adult mind, these actions were justifiable, but as Seymour's mother explained when encountered at the Chamber of the Faith in Barge Temple, due to how twisted he had become, death was the best course of action for her son. But based on Seymour's upbringing, this could have been avoided. At first glance, Cypher Ormacy was not a kind person. Depicted as the typical school bully, complete with flunkies, Cypher abused his self-induced power by the disciplinary committee to punish his fellow students and make their lives hell. Further to this, Cypher was violent and impulsive and had no respect for rules other than his own, something highlighted by his rule-breaking fight against Squall and his failed examination during the Dollop mission. It was therefore no surprise when we learned that Cypher had been seduced by the sorceress's power and positioned as the right-hand man to who at the time was believed to be the primary antagonist. Cypher then lent into this role, torturing his friends and doing whatever was commanded of him, no matter how depraved it became. Everything witnessed led the player to think that Cypher had no redeeming qualities. But in reality, Cypher was living out a fantasy. He had become obsessed with a romantic dream that was very much rooted in his determination to succeed and a fear of failure, combined with his hubris and inability to change, something that many players could relate to. Cypher was never inherently evil, he was just horribly misguided and desperate for approval. From a young age, Cypher became obsessed with a movie called The Sorceress's Night, even going so far as to learn the gun blade and copy the iconic stance of the lead actor. It also inspired him to become a knight himself, gaining a hero complex in the process. Alongside Fujin and Raijin, Cypher formed the disciplinary committee for the right reasons, as he wanted to bring order to Balam Garden. But due to his poor attitude and overzealous nature, Cypher instead got a reputation for being a bully. At the seed exam in Dolet, this proved to be his undoing. Even though Cypher's intuition was correct, and he uncovered Galbadia's covert scheme, he was chastised for directly disobeying orders. This saw Cypher fail the seed exam, and it backed him into a corner. More extreme measures were necessary, but after his plot to help Renoa failed, he ended up being seduced by Adia. Cypher initially thought everyone would be envious of his position and success, but he quickly found out it was not as glamorous as he thought, and by the time he was encountered at the lunatic Pandora, Cypher was a shadow of his former self. Wearing torn clothes, he claimed he had nothing left and nowhere to go. Even his best friends begged him to stop and come home, but Cypher believed nobody would ever be able to forgive the terrible things he'd done. He had become the villain of his own story, rather than the hero he thought he was. Fortunately, Cypher's story ended more positively than it started. His two best friends stuck with him through thick and thin, and despite the atrocities Cypher had committed, they went fishing with him as if nothing had ever happened. Throughout much of Final Fantasy XV, Arden's motivations were unclear. Those who watched Kingsglaive knew that Arden was not to be trusted. But even for those who hadn't, 
He worked for the Niflheim Empire and was therefore a sworn enemy. It meant Arden's acts of kindness, whereby he would aid Noctis and his friends, were quite bizarre to say the least, but his eccentric nature helped him to become somewhat endearing. Those illusions began to be shattered as the narrative developed, as the cruel and calculating nature of Arden was exposed. This was delivered on an individual and personal level through characters such as Prompto and Ravis, but also on a much grander scale by the rapid downfall of the Niflheim Empire itself. By the end of the game, Arden painted a very dark picture, but based on how he acted, it was always alluded that there was something amiss in terms of Arden's status as an antagonist. Yes, he had committed atrocities, but the question started to become, why? That question was then answered in rather emphatic nature via episode Arden. Through the animated short and the downloadable content itself, we learnt the truth about Arden, or Arden Lucis Kylum as he was once known. Many years prior, Arden was a kind and gentle man with a unique power, the ability to heal the Star Scourge disease that plagued Aeos. He did this by absorbing the illness into himself, and it led to Arden being heralded as a hero by the land. But that same power also proved to be Arden's downfall. While he could absorb the Star Scourge from others, he couldn't cure it entirely, and so with every soul he healed, his own became more and more tainted. Arden's brother, Somnus, saw an opportunity to declare Arden unfit to rule through his deteriorating condition. And the conflict that ensued saw the death of Arden's beloved, Era, the first oracle, and his despair outwardly manifested. Because of this, the crystal rejected Arden for his darkened soul, allowing Somnus's plan to succeed, and Arden was cast aside as a monster of his own creation. Somnus executed Arden, but due to his interaction with the crystal, Arden was cursed with immortality. As such, death was no longer possible, so he was exiled to Angelguard, which would be his home for the next 2,000 years. Tortured by his own demons and left to rot, when Arden was freed by Vestal, he set about enacting a plan of revenge against the line of Lucis. But just as he was on the brink of achieving his goal, Bahamut revealed himself as the true villain. He gave Arden a new task to spread the Star Scourge so that the true king might arrive. He asked Arden to manufacture his own downfall and to become the villain. Arden had only ever wanted to help the people of Aeos, but this led him down a path of ruin, and it wasn't until Noctis became the true king that Arden was able to find peace. Caius Ballard would suffer a similar fate. Once a member of the proud Ballard clan, Caius served as the protector of the Cirrus, Yule, for many years. He performed this role with great pride and looked forward to his reward, death at the hands of his successor. However, before his successor could land the death blow, a rival tribe attacked. Even though the ritual had not been completed, Caius' successor still assumed the role of the Cirrus' protector and gave his life defending her during the ensuing battle. Caius, Having witnessed this, was shocked by what had transpired. He felt it should have been he who lost his life in defence of the Cirrus, and as the battle with the tribe raged on, Caius decided to make the ultimate sacrifice. He would give his own life to defeat their foes and remove the danger to Yule. The goddess Etro was moved by this martyrdom, and sought to reward Caius by giving him immortality, so that he may watch over the Cirrus for eternity. But this blessing soon became a curse. Caius' immortality meant he was forced to watch Yule suffer and die by her own curse, only to be reincarnated over and over again. Where the rest of the universe saw Yule as a single entity, Caius got to know and care for them all individually, and as the years went on, he was driven mad with grief, only wanting to remove both his curse and Yule's by any means possible. He surmised that this could be achieved by the destruction of the Heart of Chaos, but this could only be achieved by another Guardian, of which there was only one left remaining, Noel. Caius had tried to train Noel to be his release, but Noel was not strong enough to best Caius, and so he made plans to kill Etro himself in Valhalla. Caius would end up achieving his goal. Noel pierced his heart, killing him and Etro, but the consequences were not what had been anticipated. Chaos poured into the world, and with the cycle of reincarnation gone, all of the Yules manifested within the Chaos into a single, conflicted will. 
Some of them couldn't let Caius go due to their fear of being alone, and some wished him to find peace. It meant that although Caius could die, according to the will of some, if he did, the will of the others would bring him back. And thus, Caius was cursed with immortality a second time. But now, he had to live with the knowledge that he had doomed the world. Unlike some of the other antagonists, however, Caius did make amends. As penance for his crimes, he became the new god of salvation, the replacement for Etro, and his final act before embarking on his new role was to release the final Yule from her role so that she could live out her days alongside Noel, something which showed the value he placed on his friendship with Noel and his respect for each Yule individually. Now, Final Fantasy has given depth to its villains since the very beginning, with even Garland having clear motivations. But with the dawn of the 16-bit era, Square were able to infuse so much more into their villains, and nowhere is that more apparent than with Golbez. As a child, Golbez, born with the name Theodore, was a kind-hearted individual who wanted nothing more than to learn magic to impress his father. But despite all his attempts, he couldn't quite muster the strength, even failing to heal his father on his deathbed. With his mother then passing away in childbirth, Theodore was left alone with his baby brother Cecil. All hope seemed lost, but a voice belonging to Zemus came to Theodore and manipulated him into thinking that the baby was the cause of his parents' death. Thus, Golbez was born. Theodore's vulnerability allowed Zemus to take control, pushing him to abandon the baby Cecil and flee from the world. Throughout much of the game, this context was not known, and Golbez was painted as a quintessential bad guy. He used his four fiends to enact brutal subterfuge, mind-controlled Cecil's best friend, and in general, created havoc across the land. And when encountered, it became clear that Golbez had become a master magician. It wasn't until Cecil and the party encountered Fusayar on the moon that they discovered Golbez was not acting of his own accord. Once Zemus' spell was broken, Golbez attempted to atone for his sins, even given a full redemption arc within the after years. And depending on the player's actions, Golbez could even be granted a martyr's death. That then brings us on to our final entry, Emmet Sulk. So if you have not progressed past Stormblood in Final Fantasy XIV, please treat this as a pretty big spoiler warning. Originally known as Hades in the time of the Ancients thousands of years ago, the new title of Emmet Selk was bestowed upon him after being invited to become a member of the Convocation of the Fourteen. While recruiting another member of the Convocation, Hermes, they found a way to stop the final days, a cataclysmic event whereby their creation magics would be perverted into destroying the world. The method they found to prevent this was to summon Zodiac, a ritual that came with a great cost, the lives of half of the ancient population. Everything went according to plan, as Zodiac managed to halt the final days, but there was an unexpected cost. The world was still ravaged. A new plan was therefore hatched to restore the world to its former glory, but it required the remaining ancients to sacrifice their lives. As this was deemed an even larger cost, a third ritual was planned. This too would require a sacrifice, the lives that they had created. But before the third ritual could take place, it was stopped by Vanar, who felt the sacrifice was too great. The actions of Vanar left Emmet Selk and a few other members of the convocation isolated and alone. Their world, their friends, and their lives were gone in an instant unable to return. Now calling themselves Asians, they vowed to do anything they could to bring their world back to the way it was by restoring Zodiac and performing the third ritual. This led to Emmet Selk founding the Garlean Empire, and through this vessel, he would bring the world to its knees, murdering millions in the process and destroying civilizations in the name of bringing his own people back. To any other being, Emmet Selk was the embodiment of evil a font of destruction blinded by his own selfish goals. But in reality, Emmet was wounded by an eternity of pain, losing everything he held dear, but given the thread of hope that they could be returned. He hardened himself to his surroundings, not seeing the beings of the sundered worlds as living things, so that he could remain focused on his ultimate goal. But with those seven characters now discussed, which bad guy have you always felt quite sympathetic towards? Let us know in the comments below, and if you enjoyed this video, please hit that like button and subscribe for more content. 
All right, everyone, with that, this is Daryl signing out. As always, I'd like to give a big thank you to all of our Patreon and YouTube membership supporters, especially Benjamin Snow, The Livestream, Gregory, Justin Dent, and Sukun TDK, who are super special Onion Eye supporters. And of course, a big thank you to everyone for watching this video. I'll see you all again soon for more Final Fantasy goodness.